Welcome to Loudon Soccer's Saturday Session and Game Day Series, a collection of videos to help our head coaches and assistant coaches better understand the format and their responsibilities each Saturday during the season. Loudon Soccer's mission is to create soccer players, coaches, and teams of strong character committed to achievement on the field and in our community. Our philosophy is to develop champions for life. Loudoun Soccer is governed by its five core values, fun, integrity, fairness, teamwork, and stewardship. We love sports and all the benefits that they provide. Those Saturday game days and sessions can bring out the best of us, but they can also bring out the worst. It's really important that we as adult leaders, head coaches and assistant coaches set a positive example for others to follow. Remember, it is for the kids. Please live our values and rep the red. The following presentation refers to our formats for the Saturday sessions and game days for all of our age groups. Coaches are expected to visit our Safe Return to Play page at loudonsoccer.com specifically to review the game day protocols and modifications to ensure that all of our members stay safe and stay healthy during this time. Game schedules are available within your team page. Log into your user account to see them. We encourage all of our members to double check those details on a regular basis. Sometimes there may be a change. With advance notice, a location or time change will be communicated via email. But on the day of, if fields close, you may be alerted uh, via email or text. There's also such a thing as a game time decision, meaning we show up at the field scheduled to play, but if conditions worsen at that location, the person in charge, whether it's a lead trainer or a referee or the absence of both the head coaches, will make a decision on the spot whether to play. In terms of game reschedules, we already deconflict head coaches of multiple teams. So if you're coaching two or more teams, we will take care of conflicts for you. But in the event we miss something, please notify us immediately so we can correct it. If there is a reschedule due to a weather or field related issue, that reschedule will be generated by the program manager and communicated to you. But for all other reschedules, it is very difficult for us to accommodate. But if you do have a conflict, we will do everything we can for you. Here's what we ask of you. First, check with your assistant coach if you have one to see if he or she is available to cover. Try to play the game as scheduled. But if you don't have an assistant coach or he or she is not available to cover, notify your program manager as soon as possible. Your program manager will work with you and the other team's coach on a reschedule and will get that fixed as soon as possible. Coaches should not reschedule on your own because you will not have a referee if your age group allows it. It's important that we reschedule the game for you so we can notify the referee assigner and he or she can do their best to assign a referee to be at your rescheduled match. Soccer is an outdoor sport. We try to play as often as we can, but sometimes weather and fields do not cooperate. So as a rule of thumb, Check your email or text alerts for any field closure updates each Saturday you're scheduled. Decisions are made by Loudoun County Parks and Rec each Saturday morning as to whether or not the fields are open. And those fields may close after heavy rain or water saturation. If those fields are closed, absolutely no training or game takes place. If the fields are open, game on. We just hope the weather cooperates. So if we see lightning or hear thunder, it is a 30 minute delay. Get everyone under cover. Please make sure you know where all your players are. We play in rain as long as the fields are open. So coaches do not cancel Saturday games or sessions. A game time decision may occur on the field, whether it's by the lead trainer or the referee, or the head coaches in the absence of a lead trainer or referee, but unless you hear otherwise from the club, game on. 
each individual family is responsible for outfitting their child with the following items. A quick note about shin guards, they should be fully covered by long socks. Make sure that the socks go over the shin guards. Also a quick note, make sure to remind families to bring plenty of water, especially on those hot days. A few special notes about equipment. In terms of shoes or cleats, soccer cleats and turf shoes are permitted. Regular athletic shoes, gym shoes are permitted. But baseball or football cleats, due to having a front toe stud, are not permitted. Referees are instructed not to allow a child to participate if a front toe stud exists. So make sure your families are aware of this requirement. Another one. No jewelry is permitted. This can be a big deal for girls who often have their ears pierced. Those earrings need to come out because they're a safety hazard for that child and for others. Covering them with bandages or tape is not permitted. Lastly, a child may participate with a hard cast as long as it is padded and fully covered. If your game has a referee, the referee will determine based on their best judgment, whether that cast is properly padded and covered and safe for other participants. Coaches should bring their own equipment, especially that first aid kit and ice pack in case there are injuries on the field. It's also a good idea as coaches accumulate more equipment to perhaps pack extra shin guards or extra jerseys in case a child shows up and forgets one of their required items. For grades one through eight, the home team or the team listed first wears red and the away or visiting team, the team listed second on the schedule, wears white. Coaches should arrive early to set up their field and to lead their team in a warm up. and players and families should also arrive early. We want to make sure the game starts on time, so make sure warm up time is planned for. If you arrive and a game is still going on in the field, please let it finish and let those teams depart before you set up. When warming up, avoid using the goal or penalty area on grass fields. That's a high traffic area that sees a lot of action and we want to avoid wearing it down as much as possible. It's also important that we greet the referee and the opposing coach. Have a quick gathering to confirm the variations to the formats, and it also sets a positive tone for our players and spectators when we see the coaches and the referees working together. To keep these games managed, it's important that everyone knows where they are allowed to sit and where they're not. Teams are going to occupy one touchline on opposite halves, Spectators will be on the opposite touchline across from their team. Coaches should remain in the technical area. That's the space between the midfield line and the top of the penalty area. Everyone, whether it's a coach or player or spectator, needs to be at least 10 feet from the touchline. That's three big steps away. No one is permitted within the penalty area or behind the goals unless some modifications to allow physical distancing requires it. But if anyone is in that area, no coaching, instructing, directing, cheering, or distracting is permitted in that area of the field. Only players on your official team roster may participate in these sessions or games. It is imperative. Do not permit unregistered players to play. It is a serious liability issue. Similarly, only approved coaches may coach the players on these days, whether it's warming up the team or sitting on the team sideline of the field. An approved coach is someone who's registered, has completed a background check, they appear on your team page, and they've completed safe sport training. If they haven't accomplished these tasks, do not let them interact with your team as a coach. International soccer is governed by FIFA. 
FIFA creates its laws of the game, which are the rules that the highest level of soccer plays under. Revisions to those rules are implemented every year on June 1st. Youth soccer will further modify these laws of the game to fit the age and ability of those athletes. Loudoun Soccer creates and provides abridged rules to help coaches better understand these modifications. If you picked up your equipment, you will have one in the folder, but you can also find one digitally in our Coaches Info Center. First and second grade teams play four versus four. Four players on the field, no goalkeepers. The game format is a 40-minute match four 10-minute quarters, a short break in between each quarter, and a longer break at halftime. For this fall 2020 season, we will be foregoing the pregame coin toss. Instead, home team, the team that wears red, will choose which side to defend and will kick off the second half of the game. The away or visiting team, the team that's wearing white, will kick off the first half. In terms of starting each quarter, the first quarter is also the start of the first half. And the third quarter is also the start of the second half, which we've just described how those will restart. But for the second quarter and the fourth quarter, those will start the way the previous quarter ended. So if the first quarter ends with a corner kick for the red team, the second quarter should begin with that corner kick. In terms of playing time, everyone should play at least half the game. Additionally, no child should play three quarters without everyone on your team playing two, and no child should play all four quarters without everyone playing three. Most of us have rosters of eight players, and if they all show up, it's pretty easy to organize. Form two groups of four players. Group one will play the first and the third quarters, Group two will play the second and the fourth quarters. If you have fewer than eight, either on your roster or on that game day, try to reward players who deserve it with some additional playing time. It doesn't always have to be the best player on your team, but maybe it's for the child who has been attending practice regularly, showing a positive attitude, working hard, give them some more playing time. In terms of rotations, Substitutions are made at the quarter breaks or if, the, if someone is injured. They are not made at stoppages or within the flow of the game. This makes our management very easy because players play for a quarter and then they can rotate out. In the event one team cannot field a full starting lineup, then the play balance rule should be adhered to. When that situation arises, our preferred method is that the team that is short players borrows a player or two from the other team so that the preferred format of 4v4 or 7 versus 7 etc. can take place as scheduled. We also encourage that borrowed player to be rotated so no child feels like they're being shortchanged or feels conflicted about playing their friends and teammates. This allows more players to play, so coaches should work together to coordinate. But if for some reason the team that's short prefers not to borrow a player or two, then those teams can play down for even numbers, assuming, of course, that the team that has more players does not violate the minimum playing time standard. This is unlikely to occur for first and second grade games due to the roster size and the game format, but coaches should work together prior to kickoff in the event one of their teams cannot field a full lineup. Coaches should rotate players into multiple positions. This can be done throughout the game, but if it's not done through the game, it should definitely be done throughout the season. Give those players opportunities to play different positions throughout the season. Do not pigeonhole a player at a young age to a specific position. It will only hurt their development and their joy for the game. 
For first and second grade games, all restarts are kicks. No throw-ins at this age group yet. Restarts are considered indirect, meaning you cannot score directly from them. There are several restarts we may see, but some of the common ones include kickoffs, goal kicks, and corner kicks. Kickoffs are how we start the first and second half of play, and also how we restart after a goal is scored. For a kickoff, teams must be in their defensive halves. The ball may be played in any direction, and the defending team must be at least five yards away. A goal kick occurs when the ball crosses over your end line, last touched by the opposing team, or if you kick the ball out of bounds over the other team's end line. The defending team during a goal kick must retreat into its defensive half and may pressure the ball once it's played. This midfield build-out line is in place to allow some flow of the game, since first and second graders typically leg, lack leg strength in order to clear the ball down the field. If a ball crosses over the end line and it's last touched by the defending team, the restart is a corner kick for the attacking team. It takes place in the corner of the field. The offside law is not enforced in 4v4 play. As a result, we have two modifications we need to be aware of. No goalkeepers and no cherry pickers. For those goalkeepers, we do not want players standing in front of their own goal, especially when the ball is up the field. Nor do we want players standing in front of the opposing team's goal, especially when the ball is back in their own defensive end. Encourage players to stay connected to the play. Push up and drop back as the ball moves forward and backward up and down the field. If you want to win the first or second grade World Cup, playing with a cherry picker or camping a player back at their own defensive end might be an effective strategy, but it violates the spirit of the rule, but more importantly, it will underdevelop those players. Please, no cherry pickers, no goalkeepers. Some teams may be stronger or more competitive than others. Might be throughout the season, could be just that day. But when we encounter that sort of imbalance, we have the competitive balance rule which states that when one team is losing by four goals, they may add an extra player to the field. They don't have to, but it's encouraged. Once that deficit is reduced to three, that specific extra player should be removed. Additionally, if your team is leading by a large amount, coaches are expected to adjust their style to avoid running up the score. A few suggestions. Rotate positions. Maybe you play some of those underdeveloped players more in attacking positions and give them an opportunity to score. You might play those less developed players more. Or, depending on the age, you might even consider adding a condition to the game, such as your team needs to connect five consecutive passes before they try to score. Ultimately, these steps are in place to avoid blowouts from occurring. In terms of some safety measures, no slide tackling is permitted in grades one through six. Also, at this age, heading is not permitted. If a player intentionally heads the ball, the restart is a free kick for the other team. But if it is an unintentional header, the ball is dropped by the referee to the opposing team to restart play. In terms of context, this no-heading rule is administered by the Virginia Youth Soccer Association, which is the governing body of soccer in Virginia. It limits heading at the youngest age groups, gradually introduces it as the kids mature until there is no restriction in training and games for our oldest youth soccer players. Head injuries are serious, and they can occur in a couple different ways in the game of soccer, whether it's a ball hitting the head, or two heads colliding, or a player falling and hitting their head on the ground, among others. 
if you suspect a child has sustained a concussion, remove them from the field immediately. Check for symptoms. That player is barred from returning that day if you think they've sustained a concussion. Our rule of thumb is when in doubt, set them out. Make sure their family is aware of the symptoms that you've recognized and make sure that they know they need to go see a doctor before returning. You as a coach after the game should notify the club of the player who may have sustained a concussion and then it's up to that family to go provide a return to play document from their medical provider before rejoining the next practice or game. We have uh, ad additional information on concussions and our protocols in our coaches information center. It's a good habit to go check that out prior to each season so you're well versed on what to look for and how to handle them. Soccer is a physical sport, which means injuries can occur. It's important that coaches bring their first aid kit and their ice packs so they can treat minor injuries. If we encounter any severe or major injuries, call 911 or send that child to the hospital with their parents. If a player suffers an injury while on the field, the referee must stop the play before you can enter the field to check on them. You may need to get the referee's attention if they don't see the player has been injured. It's also important that you as the coach receive permission to enter the field from the referee before you do so. Failure to do so may result in you as a coach receiving a yellow card. An injured player does not need to be subbed, but as a rule of thumb, if the play stops for their health, they should probably exit the field. Depending on the severity of the injury or the age of the player, you as a coach might enlist the help of their parent to care for the child so that you can focus on the rest of the players. A match may be suspended, meaning delayed, or abandoned, meaning canceled, due to inclement weather or field conditions. This is what we referred to earlier as a game time decision. If we see lightning or hear thunder, it's an automatic 30 minute delay. That clock resets with each subsequent sign. Everyone should be waiting in their cars when that occurs. The referee ultimately determines if a game is suspended or abandoned. We have to be mindful of the matches taking place immediately afterward, and it's not fair to impact their kickoff time if our match is suspended. If your match is suspended or abandoned, please notify your program manager after the game so that we can determine when or if it should be rescheduled. Let's talk about referees. First and foremost, they are independent of Loudoun Soccer. They're certified through U.S. Soccer and they're free to work any soccer matches nationwide. Unfortunately, there's a severe shortage of referees, both in terms of the quantity and quality not just in Loudoun County or in Virginia, but nationwide. Most of our referees are young and inexperienced. They are also learning just like players, which means they're gonna make mistakes. One of the referee's primary jobs is to interpret the laws of the game. Those interpretations are going to vary. They'll change from referee to referee and from game to game. What one referee might consider a handball, another referee may not. The hope for us as coaches is that that referee's interpretations that day will be consistent throughout that match. That consistency is going to be hard to come by. Referees are human. Mistakes are going to be made. And if you watch any type of sport at the highest level, you will recognize that officiating errors occur. So if we see them happening on Super Bowl Sunday or the Champions League final, we should expect them to happen Saturday morning at the local elementary or middle school. Set your expectations accordingly. The referee is considered the boss of the game. They're in charge, even if they're a pimply-faced, voice-cracking teenager who barely blows the whistle. Dissent is considered any questioning of the referee's authority which can also result in the coach or a player being ejected from the match. 
please don't focus on the referees. They're out of your control, much like the weather. Focus on your players instead. There is zero tolerance toward referee abuse or referee assault. Either will be dealt with swiftly and severely. If you as a coach have a serious concern about an official or would like to provide some feedback, positive or constructive, email our referee development coordinator with the specific details and let our referee leadership help these officials improve. Referees are assigned to matches by certified referee assigners. If we know in advance that your game does not have a referee assigned to you, we'll notify you the day of so you can plan accordingly. The match should still be played. Sometimes assigned referees don't show. There might be a last minute conflict. Sometimes life happens. If a referee does not show, please play the game. The coaches might alternate quarters or halves refereeing the match, or perhaps you can find a parent or an older sibling to officiate instead. If a referee does not show, please notify us so we can find out why that referee no-showed and hold them accountable. We as coaches need to model appropriate behavior. It's important that we serve as that positive role model for our players, our parents, and our fellow coaches. Recognize that you as a coach are responsible for your team and fan conduct. So if you witness inappropriate behavior, please correct it. At the same time, you are not responsible for the behavior of others outside of your team. So please avoid confrontations with knuckleheads. It is not your responsibility to defuse it. So please keep cool, walk away, and report them to us. Be the bigger person. Remember, it's for the kids and it should be fun. At the end of each game, make sure we show a good game gesture to our opponents. We're not doing handshake lines, so find a, an appropriate, physically distant gesture to thank the other team for playing. Be sure to also thank the referees. Air fist bumps or air high fives can suffice. Please quickly clean and clear your bench area so the next teams can get set up. Unfortunately, for safety purposes this year, no post-game snacks permitted. For this age group, no score reporting is required. But we do ask that if you encounter any serious issues involving your team, the opposing team, the referee, or about your field, please notify the program manager via email so we can tackle it right away. For additional resources, please visit our Coaches Info Center. That's where you'll be able to find rules and policies. For on-field assistance, visit our Coaching Education Resource Center for helpful articles and videos and documents. You also have technical staff members at your disposal to answer questions for you or to provide you advice or guidance. We as coaches play an important role in the lives of these young athletes. We can make or break their experience. So it's important that we keep a healthy perspective. Recognize that your value as a coach is not measured by wins or losses. It's really measured by the enjoyment and the development of these players as individuals and as athletes. Make it fun for the kids. So they want to keep coming back. And please set a positive example so others on the field, other coaches, parents, spectators, can follow your lead. Thanks for coaching with us, and good luck this season.